War Games, predicting who would win a cross-strait war. In a Japanese think tank's latest simulation, Taiwan emerges victorious, with Beijing failing to conquer the island. But both sides sustain heavy losses. As for the players, Beijing on one side, facing off with Taiwan, the US and Japan. The year 2026, the losses, tens of thousands killed or wounded on either side, with the tide turning at a key point in battle. But what about after 2026, when most experts predict China's military growth will reach a new stage? How do you think it might play out? Let us know below and subscribe if you haven't already. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A victory for Taiwan, with Beijing failing to seize control of the island. Both sides taking on huge losses of both troops and equipment. The scenario is the result of a war game simulation by a Japanese think tank. The game visualizes an attack by land and sea, the year set to 2026. On one side is China, on the other, Taiwan, the U.S. and Japan. After a two-week simulation battle, 40,000 Chinese soldiers were killed or wounded. China lost more than 150 warships, including two carriers, and about 170 warplanes. The other side wins, but with a heavy cost. The simulation battle shows the U.S., Japan and Taiwan losing more than 700 warplanes and over 50 warships in total. About 26,000 soldiers were killed or wounded. Among them, over 10,000 are Americans. The war game simulation runs on the premise that both sides are determined to win at any cost. Under it, the PLA, or Chinese Army, set up a command center that was able to deploy all of the country's military power, including submarines. The U.S. responded by sending out two nuclear-powered aircraft carriers and cutting-edge stealth fighter jets. Japan didn't get involved at the beginning only allowing the U.S. to use Japanese military bases. But after Chinese planes started attacking those bases, Japan joined the battle. The turning point came when the U.S. and Japanese forces cut the PLA supply lines. Last year, the U.S.-based Center for Strategic and International Studies carried out 24 simulations showing a war over Taiwan. Those tests produced similar results, with China defeated the majority of the time. All the simulations are based on current military power of the countries involved. Though the situation might change after 2026, as as China quickly expands its military might, including nuclear weapons. War games aren't the only factor the Chinese regime would have to contend with. The Central Intelligence Agency says Beijing might be more hesitant to invade Taiwan than it lets on. CIA Chief William Burns said, based on U.S. intel, Chinese leader Xi Jinping has instructed his country's military to be ready by 2027 to invade the island. Though that doesn't mean a 2027 invasion is imminent. Burns added that Xi may be harboring doubts about his ability to win that kind of war. That's in light of Russia's experience in its invasion of Ukraine. Despite that forecast, Beijing is adjusting its laws, paving the way for war. According to Chinese state media, Beijing issued an order on Saturday involving China's criminal law. The change says the Chinese army can take over the judiciary during times of war and grants the military permission to adjust certain legal procedures. How that would work? To be decided by the CCP's Central Military Commission. China affairs analyst Lai Jianping believes it's part of Beijing's preparations to attack Taiwan. From the day the Taiwan attack is launched, there will be a so-called legal environment to serve its invasion. It's to force soldiers to fight and be cannon fodder unconditionally. Another China affairs analyst, Tang Jinyuan, makes another point. He says as long as wartime declaration remains active in China, anyone who voices opinions that stray from Beijing's narrative could be at risk, meaning army soldiers emboldened with Beijing's authority could start making arrests. How determined is Taiwan to fight the Chinese Communist Party if a military conflict were to break out? Taiwan's defense minister said Friday that Taiwan would fight to the end until all guns have been fired. 
He added that the Chinese regime would be unable to take Taiwan within two weeks. The comments responded to a number of expert questions, suggesting that China learned from Russia's Ukraine war and would likely seek a quick takeover of Taiwan. Chu pointed out that no matter how fast it wants to move, Beijing's army still must cross the Taiwan Strait. The body of water acts as a natural barrier between the island and mainland China. Plus, Chu says the Taiwanese army has been exercising its combat readiness daily. The official went on to acknowledge that though some Taiwanese soldiers could die in battle, none of them would surrender without a fight. Mafia-like threats by the Chinese Communist Party on American soil. That's what a representative said over the weekend when he rallied with a group of lawmakers and Chinese dissidents in the center of New York City. The goal? To counter Beijing's overseas operations. Here's more. An innocent-looking building in downtown Manhattan, now the center of a highly attended event where CCP opponents called out Beijing's totalitarianism. It's all because the American Changlil Association hid a sinister surprise inside, an unauthorized police service center linked to the CCP. Quote, two options, return to China promptly or commit suicide. These are actual quotes that CCP agents have said to people here on American soil. The outpost came to light last fall. Agents there have reportedly harassed and spied on Chinese nationals in American neighborhoods. Since then, the FBI has raided the facility and the State Department shut it down. How have we allowed this to happen on American soil? The answer, in my opinion, is that we have been blind. Describing the CCP threats as veiled and very cunning, Gallagher accuses the communist regime of exerting what he calls mafia-like influence around the globe and coercing distance with Muslim threats to bend to his will. And like the mafia, they aren't afraid to make people disappear. Last year, human rights watchdog Safeguard Defenders exposed more than 100 such unauthorized CCP police stations in 53 countries, including four U.S.-based stations two in New York City, one in Los Angeles, and one in an undisclosed location. Victims of the CCP suppression attended the event in New York. They include Uyghurs, Mongolians, Hong Kongers, Tibetans, and Falun Gong practitioners. The number one victim of the CCP is the Chinese people. That message from Congressman Neil Dunn is central to the House China Select Committee. That is, to differentiate between the CCP and the Chinese people. Donna Gallagher will also be joined by Congressman Richie Torres in what appears to be a bipartisan effort to expose CCP threats to Chinese Americans and U.S. sovereignty itself. The defense of human rights from the abuses of the CCP is not a Democratic value or Republican value, it's an American value. Yeah. Efforts to counter the CCP are especially important for overseas Chinese dissidents like Zhou Fengsuo. He's one of the CCP's most wanted for participating in the Tiananmen student protest in 1989. This is the first time that uh, we feel that we are hurt uh, by American uh, government. The House China Select Committee will be holding a hearing on Tuesday on the Chinese Communist Party threat to America. A U.S. patrol aircraft getting up close and personal to this Chinese J-11 fighter jet. The two planes streaking through the skies just a few hundred feet away from each other. The mid-air meet between the U.S. and China happened Friday above the hotly contested South China Sea. Beijing claims most of the territory as its own, despite objection from countries like Vietnam and the Philippines. International rulings also disagree with China's claim. The Chinese jet comes armed with four air-to-air missiles. Here's what U.S. troops heard over the radio just before it appeared in the sky. American aircraft, this is the PLA Air Force. You are approaching Chinese airspace. Keep a safe distance or you'll be intercepted. PLA stands for People's Liberation Army, the formal name of the Chinese military. The jet flew so close, its pilots were visible in their cockpit. The U.S. soon responded. PLA fighter aircraft, this is U.S. Navy P-8 
on VHF 121.5. I hold you off my left wing and I intend to continue to proceed to the west. Beijing's jet didn't answer and later departed as the U.S. plane turned south. Washington maintains a presence in the region, largely to rein in Chinese expansion and to monitor Beijing's militarization of artificial islands there. Officials say these close encounters have become a near daily occurrence and are getting more dangerous. That warning echoes a disaster from 2001. On the morning of April 1st, U.S. Navy EP-3 aircraft and a Chinese Navy J-8 fighter collided mid-flight. The crash killed the Chinese pilot, Lieutenant Commander Wang Wei, and destroyed Beijing's plane. The damaged U.S. reconnaissance plane made an emergency landed on Hainan Island. The Chinese fighter had been monitoring the American aircraft as it performed reconnaissance on China, a situation eerily similar to Friday's run-in. About six in ten Americans say they are gravely concerned about China more than those who say they're worried about Russia. What's more, 45 percent of U.S. adults say they are happy with how President Biden is handling China. The Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs Research conducted the poll, speaking to over 1,200 Americans in February. Looking at policy, the White House has kept tariffs on imports from China while limiting advanced microchip exports to the country. These moves have drawn anger from Beijing. Biden has tried to frame relations with China as a competition with boundaries rather than a geopolitical clash. He said earlier this month, we seek competition, not conflict with China. We're not looking for a new Cold War. But tensions have skyrocketed in recent weeks after the shootdown of a Chinese spy balloon that had floated across the U.S. Other concerns about Beijing center on it giving possible military support for Russia's war in Ukraine and how it impacts U.S. economic health. Top finance ministers from the world's 20 most powerful countries ending a meeting in deadlock on Saturday. That's after China and Russia declined to endorse a joint statement. NTD Sam Wang has the latest. The statement condemns Putin for his invasion of Ukraine. It took the position of the G20 Bali summit last year, suggesting that the use or threat of the use of nuclear weapons is inadmissible. It also demanded Russia completely withdraw from Ukrainian territory. Last Tuesday, Putin's suspension of the nuclear arms reduction deal made new waves. With Beijing's economic and diplomatic support for Moscow, the Biden administration recently warned that China could provide military aid to Russia. The lack of consensus among G20 members led India to issue what's called a chair summary. The notice outlined what was discussed during the summit, the outcomes of the talks, and which member countries are on board with what points. India's finance minister said no joint decision was reached due to objections from China and Russia. The Indian finance minister neither condemned nor approved Russia's invasion. Although there was uh, what you would call not a chair uh, or not a communique, but only an outcome statement, I would still think we've made uh, good progress in having all the ministers on board. The nation also didn't denounce China's current support for Russia. Reporting from New York City, Sam Wong, NTD News. Now, over to Europe. Bad news for wealthy Chinese people who are looking to leave the country. Ireland and Portugal are closing a visa scheme for wealthy foreign investors. The UK did the same last year. The Residence by Investment Program, or Golden Visa Program, has been popular among Chinese millionaires. But the European Union warned there could be security risks. Under the program, foreigners could immigrate to Ireland by investing at least $1 million or donating over $530,000 to philanthropic causes. Investors and their family members could apply for Irish citizenship after living in the country for five years. The scheme generated more than $1.2 billion over a decade. Of last year's 1,300 applications, over 1,200 were from China. But Ireland's justice minister announced that the country will close the program. He said officials took studies by the EU into consideration. Those studies say that the citizenship programs pose security risks and called on countries to close them. Ireland is not the only European country to halt the program. Portugal took the same step last week. Almost half the country's foreign investors who benefited from the program were Chinese citizens. And last year, the U.K. closed its own pay-and-stay program. 
Any foreigner who invested $2.4 million in the U.K. would get permission to stay. The U.K.'s closure of the program was aimed at cutting off Russian tycoons from transferring their money out of Russia. But the biggest beneficiary group was Chinese citizens. Spain, Italy, and Greece still run similar programs. And they're not limited to Europe either. Similar programs exist in the United States, Canada, and Australia. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. Here's what to look out for in our second half. More on China's intellectual property theft. We hear from Nicholas Eftemiadis, retired senior intelligence officer and author of Chinese Intelligence, Operations and Tactics, about what's at stake for America and why it's so hard to counter China's tactics. China's got a different way of doing espionage. It's a whole of society approach. China has to understand that there's a cost for their illegal behavior. And that's something the United States does very begrudgingly, if at all. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.